So this is a famous hill you said where cyclists ride every day? Flagstaff Mountain, very famous to ride up here. It's a tough climb. What's total distance, bottom to top? Uh, it's, you know, not that far, maybe two and a half, three miles, but it really picks up, gets steep near the top. Good pitch. Yeah. So I want to interview a cyclist. Will we see mm. some famous cyclists here? We might. Um, Who's I'm this guy, think, Tyler? Or who is what do you call him? Hey, Davis, Davis Finney Foundation. Maybe uh, his son, Taylor Finney, fourth in the Olympics in the road race and the time trial in London. Why don't we see if we can get him? Yeah, but what are the odds he's coming up? <sighs> we'll wait here all day until he does. Yeah, let's do it. Let's wait. Hey there, you are about to see an amazing video with a guest you are going to love. First, subscribe by hitting the button below, share it with all your friends, and leave us a comment. Tell us whether you like this or not because we're spending thousands of hours creating these. Talk to you soon. We are here, Spartan Up Podcast in Pittsfield, Vermont. It is nighttime, cold, and we've got the fire going. We're in jackets and good. pretty heavy-duty sweatshirts. we got Colonel Nye, our military correspondent. We've got our rewilding expert who lives out in the woods our yeah. our woodlands expert and then we've got johnny dr johnny who's our mind expert and we uh i went to colorado guys i met with taylor finney uh i told you i was going to see my buddy ted kennedy who i met at iron man mm, he, he used yeah. to put on uh actually iron man events in the u.s and he introduced me to alan Lim, who owns and founded scratch labs uh, he is Taylor Finney's uh, nutritional expert coach. Um, funny enough, I met Alan, uh, you'll see in Alan's podcast, if you haven't watched that already, at a croissant shop. And uh, <laughs> much to my surprise, this, this high-end nutritionist was eating croissants and drinking coffee. Yeah, he's a great man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, at, at first, my instinct would be, as I'm sure people listening would be, well, gee, that doesn't sound like somebody that, that um, takes care of the nutritional needs of high-end athletes, but... Um, Whatever he's doing for Taylor Finney seems to be working. They were going out for a bike ride the day I nailed him and uh, sat down and we uh, and we talked. So you're gonna you're gonna love this podcast. I am here in Colorado with Taylor Finney, arguably the United States number one cyclist. Is that fair to say? <laughs> Maybe in a certain discipline. <laughs> All right. Maybe in personality. <laughs> but but I, I was just informed that crashing on a bicycle is like driving 50 miles an hour down a hill in your underwear and falling out of the car? Is that, is that? It's like opening the door and just like. Rolling out? Well, yeah, cause you know, spandex, it's not, Road it's rash. not like crashing in it with a jacket on or something. How many, how many, let's dive right into that. How many accidents have you, have you had? Hopefully not many. Uh, you usually have a couple crashes a year. I mean, and, and then it kind of, the severity of that depends on, uh, depends on the situation. I have a friend, uh, Scott Berryman, he coined the phrase skin for glory, trading skin for glory. So, nice. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's whatever, body scars, life tattoos. You, you have um, any issues because of that where you're like a little, you know, you, you hold back a little bit because you're not looking to repeat that situation? You, you kind of. I had a really bad crash a couple months ago where I broke my leg in a couple different places and severed some tendons and did some really bad damage. So. Uh, I was a little skittish when I got back on the bike, and I did this uh, did this descent here in Boulder. But I kind of was like, "All right, man, you gotta just get back on the horse." I used to ski. I used to do some freestyle skiing when I was younger, and the biggest thing was, you know, when you bail, when you biff it on a on a big trick, you gotta like just do it again immediately. Otherwise, your mind you just kind of starts to mess with you. Yeah, it starts to mess with you. So I. Um, Were you in the hospital? I mean, obviously, you gotta go to the hospital. Broken leg. Yeah, I was in the hospital for two weeks. Um, I, yeah, I had a compound fracture on my tibia, uh, open compound fracture, broke my patella. But anyways, I got up to, I did this, got up to this descent uh, down Lee Hill here in Boulder, and I was just got to the top, and I was like, all right, dude, you just got to do this. And, uh, and so I, I went down, like, first corner, I was like, all right, full gas, no brakes. Come around the corner. There's like a there's like a deer walking out, and I like go around the deer, and then there's a car coming, and I like barely make it through, and I'm just like, oh my god, what am I doing? But uh, yeah, 
I ended up uh, doing the rest of the descent full gas too, and I feel pretty good about it. And so you're it. back, you're back on the horse. Yeah, for the most part. So what's your next um, big event? Uh, I probably won't race until uh, January or February. The season's almost over now. Um, how'd you, you know, do, how'd it's you do a long. The, how'd you do for the season? Well, I was doing all right until I broke until the my accident, leg. Yeah. Uh, I, I won the national championships in the time trial just two days before I broke my leg. I broke my leg in the road race in the national championships. Well, you would appreciate this this analogy, but they say if you're not like over your skis and you're not pushing at that level, then you, you, you probably can't be a champion, right? And so you're just pushing <laughs> the level, which sometimes yeah. ends up in an accident. No, you push the limits and you find out where the limits are a lot of the time. Um, you know, even now I'm having to do that in my rehab. I find out where that limit is by how hard I push, and then I can I know to go up to that limit and then kind of like back off and... It's it's definitely an interesting rehab process though you know it's like a six to nine month uh, recovery is the first sort of major setback that I've ever had. Can we dive into um, EPO and things like that? Would that be weird? I don't know. It's up to you. You want to talk drugs? I don't know. I mean, like that. I mean, because anybody thinking about cycling, even me, right, is thinking, gee, is it? Everybody must be doing it. I mean, it, not anymore. I, oh yeah, not Used anymore. To. No. I mean, uh, I cycling as a sport is one of the he most heavily tested sports in the world now. Um, so, you know, it's really hard to get away with anything. Uh, you think it's a level playing field? You think your competition is clean? For sure, there's a small percentage of guys that maybe do something. You know, there's still things that you can get away with. But, like, you know, I do my part in racing clean. And, yeah. you know, there's, I don't sit around and worry about what other people are doing if... If I can be competitive, you know, just off of my own training and my own diet and, and just, you know, being a pure athlete, then I think the sport is generally... So, so let's, w would you say over the last two years it, it got cleaned up? I would say over the last uh, 10 years. I mean, it's, it was really bad in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then it kind of started to wane out. Um, and you know when it, it, it I, I, okay, I was 15 years old when Lance won his last Tour de France. I just started uh, riding a bike, so I wasn't there for any of that, uh, you know, all of that scene. But from what I understand, you know, it got really bad, and then it started to come back down. And with the introduction of the biological passport and a lot of stuff that WADA uh, is doing and USADA is doing, and then this whole thing a couple years ago with Lance. Um, you know, that's that's really caused a, a pretty dramatic shift in the way the sport is uh, internally. You know, there's still some things here and there that you hear about, but as far as I'm concerned, as far as, you know, Team BMC is concerned, we're clean. We're but, clean. but are you seeing a drop in performance? Like, there's, if you, if you yeah. charted, if you charted, are people climbing yeah, if you slower? Look at, if you look at the numbers um, from, you know, Lance's times uh, in the Tour de France, some of those guys who have tested positive um, versus the climbs, the times now, they're definitely lower. They're definitely slower. Yeah. So just uh, mathematically, on a numerical standpoint, they're, they're definitely lower, which would, you know, imply that either no I mean, drugs everything we or heard, less yeah, drugs. Everything we've heard is accurate, right? Yeah. But I mean, the thing is, like, we get tested. I could, they could, somebody could show up right now and test me if they wanted to. Um, you know, we have to be held accountable every single day of the year. We have to tell USADA where we are, and they can test us. Um, you know, which is dramatically different than it was the NFL, sure. uh, NBA, um, baseball. You know, so when you have that high concentration of testing, and you also have the the, the press, the negative press of, you know, things that have happened in the past, uh, for sure your, your sport's going to get a, a bad rap and a bad image. But, you know, I'm thankful that I came into the sport at a time where it was waning down and I didn't have to make those decisions, you know. Sure. Nobody came up to me and was like, hey, you want to be a pro, you got to do this. It was like, hey, the sport's changed, you know. Let's do it. We yeah. There's a zero tolerance for anything. And, you know, that's when I came into BMC, that was the first meeting we had as a team was, look, zero tolerance, you're not doing anything. If you are, you're off the team. And, um, 
so I was like, well, great, because I haven't touched anything my whole career. Another interesting thing you said is you started cycling at 14, or, or did you cycle competitively starting at 14? I started racing when I was 15. I started riding a bike when I was a kid. I mean, my parents were cyclists, um, but I never thought of it as like something that I wanted to do. I played soccer. I have four kids, so it's something I think about all the time. You know, does the amazing athlete start at eight years old? Does he start at 11? Does he start at 14? And one thing, and you can confirm this or not, is um, maybe it was good that you were playing soccer mostly at a young age because you would yeah. might have gotten burnt out on the sport. No, for sure. I mean, I think it's really important for kids to do what they want and to kind of explore sports and find out what they want to do and not have their parents like, hey, like, you're really good at this. You need to do this. You need to do this or you need to try that. Here's a question for, for both you guys, all three, everybody, is um, what are the odds that the thing the kid likes to do, you actually introduce them to it? They happen to have the right body for it. I mean, there's a lot of confluences there that have to happen by luck, right? It just, like he happens to be a great cyclist. What if his parents didn't introduce him to that? Well, I have the genetics to be a cyclist, obviously, because of my parents. My sister would be a really good cyclist too, but she likes to Nordic ski, so she's a Nordic skier. And she's also really smart. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't go to college and, um, you know, I'm not like a s stupid person or anything, but I definitely kind of push her towards academics because I think that, you know, having not, having not, gone down that path I think that's really cool um, so like I pay for her college and and make sure she doesn't have any debt when she comes out and and then she'll cover you later when she's yeah out, when right? she's a you know a doctor and I'm like a cyclist. old uh, washed up cyclist that's right. just like uh, you know clawing for the for the glory days yeah. I'll be like hey sis how about send that? over some money I hope you're not sitting still while you listen if you are, you better get a burpee break in. <laughs> All right, so uh, basically we had to bring Ted in, Ted the mic, and um, we're going to go over with Alan and Taylor, and we're going to talk about the blacktop effect, which I don't know what that is. I don't actually even know if, if that's a real term. I think I made it up. But the blacktop effect is when this little kid is playing on the blacktop, you know, in school, during recess or whatever, and he just happens to run or she just happens to run faster than all the other kids. And so people start to applaud that and reward that, and they get this positive feedback. Wow, I'm a good runner. Or I'm really good at hopscotch or I'm really good at tetherball or whatever it is. And then they become interested in pursuing that, and their talent grows as the feedback or the encouragement grows as well. So it's a way to distinguish this nurture-nature effect. Are these kids actually, you know, kind of genetically predisposed to be great at a particular activity or sport, or is it their environment, their opportunity that allows it? And I think that what the blacktop effect says is that it's a combination of the two, that certainly you have to be exposed. Certainly kids figure out really quickly if they're better than others at something, and when they are, they like that attention, so they keep on pursuing it. And then ultimately what happens is it's the hard work and the practice that makes them champions. Yeah. I, um, what's interesting for me on that one is um, how do you, I know for me, I heard that cheering and that clapping were hard work. I defined myself then not as a runner but as a hard worker. And, and I know other people that that's happened to, you probably had it with cycling, right? People, you won those first two races, so you quickly defined yourself as a cyclist. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I, I needed a bit more time to get into that mode of hard work because a lot of stuff came to me really really quickly at least as a younger rider as a junior as an under 23 and then I turned pro and I entered this whole world where these guys were so much more serious and more focused um, than I had ever been and I really had to change that kind of side of me and now you know I'm one of the most most hard-working riders that I think I mean I, I don't want to like to Mount Horn but you know I think Alan would would agree um, so as long you know, as somebody agrees then it's okay no, we've done uh, we've done some stuff that that uh, you know we've done some stuff in training that I don't think anybody else really has done before. Just That's the difference, right? That's what I said. That's where Ted failed. Ted didn't want to push the extra the extra little bit, right? It was okay to have the beer, and he didn't make the Olympics. Why is it all about me? <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, you know, these guys are willing to go the extra step. He yeah. cuts tinfoil at four in the morning to for wrap food i mean the guy wants to go the extra step you know speaking speaking from my own experience um 
it wasn't until uh, I started helping Taylor and a bunch of different pros in 2012. I had essentially been retired from pro cycling, but I had some ex-athletes who were needing some help prepping for the Tour de France. Taylor had just finished the Giro d'Italia. They flew in from Europe to train here in Boulder, and uh, Taylor ended up accompanying them. And it was an interesting situation because I've seen Taylor excel from a very early age and you know just off the couch be better than others. But this was a particular uh, situation where um, these guys were, you know, much older athletes preparing for the Tour de France. Taylor was at least two years away from, you know, doing his first tour, but he was training with them. And it was the first time that Taylor maybe was a little in over his head, especially since we were doing most of the training in the hills, not on the flats where he excels as a time trialist. Um, But for me, what was amazing about that was that I've never seen an athlete being willing to just get their ass handed to them as hard as Taylor was willing to. But what ended up happening from that, from what I saw, was this kind of transformation of, of, of work ethic. And when Taylor then got the nod to be part of the Olympic team, we continued that training camp. And at that point, he elevated the, that, that, that work ethic into his Olympic preparation in a way that was completely different than I had ever experienced as a uh, cycling coach. Um, And I think really culminated right before the world championships that year where we went out with one of his teammates um, who, you know, is is, uh, certainly an amazing rider, TJ Van Garderen. And what ended up happening in those training days was that Taylor just basically handed it to him like every single ride. Um, and for me, that was still some of my fondest memories because I think from TJ's perspective, it was just completely unexpected, right? Yeah, the for new, sure. Because a new young guy? No, because I don't think that he saw the, tra- he didn't see the transformation that Taylor had gone through that summer in terms of just ability to work, ability to train, willingness to push in training. Because I think a lot of guys get a little complacent. They're like, hey, hey, hey. We need to kind of save ourselves. We got the big races. Let's just do enough, you know, go to the coffee shop, turn around. And at that point in time, I think that Taylor's wiring was just different. He was like, we're doing the climb again. Well, no, and I was that guy. I mean, I was as an under 23, you know, before I turned pro, I was the guy who I would just race and I would get fitness from racing and I would come home and I'd like ride to a coffee shop and then have a coffee and then I'd come back and not really like do anything, maybe play around, but like, not really do much and then that summer it was just like something clicked inside of me and the the rides that we would do I mean we would do an Olympic simulation basically of a time trial and a road race every week for like five weeks Uh, and that included you know a 200 to 250 kilometer ride behind a motorcycle um, doing laps of this uh, climb called old stage which is about uh, 10 minutes from the bottom to the top we do nine laps of that and um, you know we'd average like 40 kilometers an hour because we were behind the moto it would be a huge massive like 7,000 calorie day and we would do that every week and we would do huge training in the middle of that too and so you know I had done all this to build up for the Olympics and then I did the Olympics and I got fourth twice and it was a little bit heartbreaking um, but it was a lot better than I was expecting to do and then came back and kind of re-implemented that going into the world championships and brought TJ out for a couple of rides. And he was like, dude, what is this? What are you doing? You know, it's like we'd gone out on these 250 kilometer rides. Nobody, nobody does that really. Um, people will do that, you know, sometimes in the off season, but slow. And, um, so it was just kind of taking that whole, uh, taking that whole, just Approach, everything yeah. to the next level. Good stuff. I mean, that's the difference between the Olympics and not. I, I hate to keep bringing it back to you, Ted, but but people want to play. Like we, we interviewed this um, we interviewed this uh, gentleman who said uh, every day you got to play as if you're a pro. Don't play as if you're an a- amateur, right? And that's what you did. You said, no, we're playing at the Olympic level here, right, when everybody else wasn't. Yeah. Basically. No, I mean, and it's not to say that because Ted had a beer one time, he, you know, didn't don't, make don't it. Don't worry about Ted. But the thing is, like... <laughs> that's why I'm like the guy on the floor. That's why you're on the floor. He's sitting in a chair, you're on the floor. Uh, the beer. 
the nah, croissant. But, uh, the Those thing decisions is, add up, Ted. I, I, I have a good time. I know when to have a good time. But when I have a good time, I still get my work done. So every day I'm getting my work done, no matter what. Um, no matter what happens the night before, if I have a beer or not. So uh, that's kind of the way I see it. You need to have a balance. You're not a, nobody is a monk other than monks and <laughs> and, 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 and hey. triathletes. Um, but, uh, but as long as you get your work done and as long as you are constantly building and improving, um, you know, there's definitely a time to really hunker down, but you can't do that year round. We have to talk about um, adversity and getting comfortable at being uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? That's a big thing we push at Spartan is, um, I think, I don't know what you think, but uh, I think the more comfortable you can get at being uncomfortable, the more likely you'll succeed. Thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, you definitely have pain pain barriers, pain levels uh, that, you, that you reach and you exceed uh, and you're constantly building upon. Uh, you kind of reach those pain levels, whether you like to or not. Um, I just broke my leg a couple See. months ago. Whoa. And uh, right, so you're, you're comfortable being uncomfortable. I, uh, you know, whether I liked it or not, I definitely got to uh, got to a different pain level than I'd ever experienced as an athlete with this break and this break, um, and also just with the whole recovery process that's involved with all this. I mean. I lost a ton of muscle mass in my calf and in my leg. And, uh, you know, it's been four months, months since the accident. I almost have full range of motion, but I still have to work on it every day. And it's, um, you know, I still kind of walk with a limp and it's, it's uncomfortable. It's not a, it's not a fun place to be, but it is a place that, that 100% uh, is making me a, a better, at least a better athlete, a better human, understanding suffering kind of embracing struggle is really the uh, kind of has been my been my been my motto these uh, these past couple months you know as a cyclist we suffer a lot we it's a it's a tough sport and it, there's not a not a ton of reward in it um, but that reward once you do win that race um, that feeling is is so amazing that it makes all because, that because of all the work that it took to get there yeah and it's right. you know it's it's a lot of it is that is that process and it's you know, when you're able to embrace that process and you're and, and you're able to trust that that struggle that you go through, um, you know that's uh, that's what that's what makes it so special. We have um, in Spartan Race, we put obstacles in front of people, and those are metaphors for life, right? Because everybody's got an obstacle they deal with, whether it's somebody they know it's cancer or they're sick or whatever their issue may be. Um, once they go through the race, they build obstacle immunity. Is that? You go through it with cycling. I mean, you, you you probably got obstacles on a daily basis, right? And before you know it, it's like no big deal. You know, I didn't even look. I didn't want to look at my leg because it was all you know Mangled. sideways and big cut. And uh, you know, I severed my patellar tendon, which you need your patellar tendon to yeah. ride a bike. You need a, a your patellar tendon to do anything, just to just to get out of a chair. And um, so you know, putting that in perspective and knowing that that's something that could happen to me. You hear about all these stories, but you're like, that's never, you know, that happens to other people, that doesn't happen to me. But but having it happen to you, you're like, whoa, you know, I can't take this for granted. So now I know when I come back, you know, I, I'll have a different mindset. I'll have experienced this amount of pain that I've that I've never experienced before. I mean, I was just 40 minutes of, uh, of the, the worst pain you can imagine in my leg. Um, so many severed nerves and just... Yeah. just to, oh just terrible uh, but I you know I get back on the bike now and I go for it and I think about that sometimes and uh, you know it sounds kind of like cheesy but a hundred percent I go and I feel I feel less pain than I did before even though I'm less fit right now I can I push these same watts that I would normally push and I have this body reaction to it but in my mind you know it's just kind of quelled a little bit down you got, you got a new, a pain, new pain threshold. So I have this, I kind yeah. of busted through this ceiling yeah. and uh, I'm, you know, I'm sort of excited to figure out where that ceiling is now. <laughs> Outside of cycling, what is your favorite exercise? Um, I like to dance a lot. 
Dance. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one before. It's probably you know. I'm not. Uh, probably likes to dance. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to uh, you know do any twirls or anything. But you know, I like to go out and and uh, and dance and and have a good time and like ballroom um, dancing or no. I'm. I mean, just like just like getting down with whatever. Could have been in the Olympics. Had you had you followed some of this advice. Anyway, we'll see you. Uh, who knows where next? Yeah, another really interesting uh, podcast there. I think I was. Uh, Again, reoccurring themes, but the things I was struck by was his introduction into sport uh, at such an early age. Uh, not that he was forced into cycling. In fact, he says that he wasn't. Uh, but just the introduction of a family nucleus, uh, a family that's exercising together, and that he was in it. And so he evolved from it. Um, and so he, he was, uh, at an early age, got to be part of it. And kind of just grows up that way and becomes part of your DNA. So I think that that's something we've seen before over and over again about how these uh, athletes, uh, you know, it goes back to the 10,000 hours. It goes back to have an opportunity, those kinds of things. So, again, here's another here's another example where I think that it comes through. Just doesn't happen by accident. Mm-hmm. Right. I no, mean, no. Um, I, when I interviewed, uh, which you'll see on, on a future podcast, uh, the Cornell wrestling coach who's had an incredible career. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many years in a row they've they've now won titles. But he said uh, it really comes down. If he's looking for correlations, it really comes down to who the family is behind that that kid. So, and you know that you coach you yeah, coach sure. young wrestlers. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I noticed in this interview that uh, struck me, you know, anyone who's achieved a huge level of success, there've been failures along the way. You know, you never hear anyone who says nothing happened. It's all just been smooth right. sailing, and here I am in the Olympics. Here's a guy who finished fourth in the Olympics, but he was also talking about you know major uh, accident, uh, major injury, and about how you bounce back. And so when we're talking about resiliency and grit, and we're trying to figure out how people get to this uh, level of success, we're not going to hear people who got there the easy way. And I, I think that's a really great thing too. And they all seem to embrace that struggle. Uh, you know, nobody's saying, "Oh, this terrible thing happened, and it was terrible." They all say this terrible thing happened, and that's what forged who I am. So do you, do you find that with, uh, with the interview? It's funny. I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, um, wouldn't it be great to look at those statistics? Like, like terrible things happen to everybody. How yeah. many drop out? Yeah. How many are left standing? Uh, we've talked about that before. Sure. And, and um, the competition dwindles at that point, right? There's only yeah. a few left standing that have the 10,000 hours in, the good family, all the things required to, to get to the top level. Yeah, because you've got to have the internal drive. And again, you've got got to have the resources. You've got to have the support system behind you, driving you. Uh, So, yeah, as you say, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you get through the top. When I hear when I hear you guys talking about that, my mind obviously goes to like a forest ecology, right? So if you think about it, I don't know if you know what mycelium is, but it's kind of the information or nutrient transfer network of um, mushroom systems, right? And they're kind of the mat that holds the soil together underneath the entire forest and are able to transfer nutrients between the trees and the shrubs and everything else like that. So you think about a community, a family, right? That's your foundation. And the more resilient a forest is, is the stronger that organic matter that foundation is and how diverse your ecosystem is and so if you think about it you know these kids that are are raised in these really um healthy ecosystems they're just they're just more resilient naturally and and the other thing that they talked about that really resonated with me was this blacktop effect you know they say all right so they look at um kids out at recess and and for me personally um people talk about attention deficit disorder and i've i kind of identify with a guy by the name of richard loof who wrote a book called no child left inside and um Basically, the idea with nature deficit disorder is these kids, they, they, it's not like they have an attention deficit, but they need to be outside and they need to be active and they need to be in their bodies. And I think just a, a little plug to make sure that recess stays in the schools, right, and that they're able to get some exercise and physical activity. And um, just to wrap this concept up, something that Alan Lim said that I, I don't necessarily agree with is like, you're looking for who's the best out on the blacktop, right? How, who's running the fastest and you're, you're trying to identify the, the champions. But I think it's really a great time where we can role model how those kids can work together and be collaborative and, and you know, be able to some, learn some things together, so. Cool, and that comes up again and again in these interviews, um, the idea about that support network and that nobody gets there on their own, even individual sports like cycling and, uh, and wrestling, they always talk about the team and they talk about the, the people who've helped them get there. And, um, you know, that's what we're trying to do with these podcasts, I think, is to help other people get there by sharing these, these messages. So 
Yeah, it's not fair that just the uh, winners have good support systems. Let's build a support system for a much larger audience, and that's mm-hmm. and that's what this is about. Yeah, and, and you know, and thinking about Spartan, the Spartan races, uh, what a million people this year? A million people. Yeah, so they're all out there competing on their own as part of a huge community, and uh, that's that's really the masses. A million people out there, and mm-hmm. yeah, your motto is rip them off the couch and. I've seen a lot of them. A lot of them came straight from the couch. It's awesome. We'll put that fire right now, we, we've chopped up a couch outside, um, <laughs> and we're, that's what we're heating this barn with. <laughs> get rid of those couches. A bunch of couches. Yeah, get cool. rid of them. Awesome. So, uh, so Joe, tell us uh, uh, how they find out more. SpartanUpPodcast.com. You will see Colonel Nye's, um, inter- what do we call it, the interesting in- quarter? In- interactive. <laughs> the interactive. Quarter. The interesting and interactive Always corner. Always interesting. You'll learn more about uh, foraging in the woods with Sephra, and then... Um, Johnny Waite can do a quick uh, mental assessment and see if you're even um, qu- qualified to make it in life. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think I'm going to give tips and tricks so everyone can make it in life. So that's what we're going to do. And a uh, quick correction. Better. the uh, Richard Louv book is uh, Last Child in the Woods. It's there a great one. Recognize awesome. well, who wrote that other one? <laughs> my head. My brain. <laughs> hey, I hope you love what you're watching. We have put an enormous amount of time into this. We want to get people motivated, ripped off the couch, and we need your help. Please subscribe to the video. Go tell some friends to do the same. Rip them off the couch. Get them motivated. Let's get outside. Even in minus 20, it's not so bad out here.